Test. One, two. How's that? That sounds good. love we connect serve and transform
Good, good morning, good morning. Good morning. 
morning. Good morning. This is a sound check, and thank you, Bill. I think that's that's reasonable. How do your ears respond? Thank you. I'd like to talk to you about all. Good morning. Worship will start soon, and what an exciting, wonderful morning this is.
Welcome to Worship Worthington <laughs> Presbyterian Church. Please sign the friendship pads if you are in the sanctuary. And if you are worshiping online, please do check in and share a prayer concern or give us some feedback, and that'll help us to be a little bit more of a two-way relationship. I hope that those of you in the building will come downstairs to Fellowship Hall following worship to welcome Interim Coordinator of Children's Ministries, Annie Barner. We are so glad you're here, Annie. We are so glad we've even baked a cake. So come downstairs. The last two pages of your worship bulletin include service opportunities and activities. Please take a bulletin with you and plan to participate in service and education. We are getting ready to provide 250 Thanksgiving dinners to needy families. You can help. Details are in your bulletin. On November 5th, we will give the third graders their Bibles. These are not picture Bibles or children's Bibles. They are the whole Bible. You can participate in that morning. Details are in your bulletin. This is not in the bulletin. Next Sunday from noon until 2, Worthington Presbyterian Church will be on the Village Green blessing pets to support the Spooky Pooch Parade of Worthington. <laughs> Contact me if you would like to be in our team of volunteers blessing pets, um, or just come, bring your pet, and, and it will be blessed. Noon till 2 next Sunday. The prelude this morning is played by the Celebration Ringers in honor of, in memory of Marietta Britz, who died on July 17th. Um, we have a bell rem remembering her with the black ribbon. Um, she, in her life, reminded us every day of the amazing grace of the love of God for each of us. And now, Taylor Surface, I invite you to bring the moment for generosity. In Christ's love, we connect, serve, and transform. The mission statement of our church. Recently, <clears throat> I received the, the pledge card and letter from Pastor Tim uh, reminding us about the generosity campaign. And as I thought about that, the word serve connected with me and I wanted to share a little bit about what that means to me. When I think about serve, I think about the amazing people in our congregation. Each of you has gifts that help serve everyone in the congregation and the world. When we serve each other in our congregation, I think about moving here uh, when I was five years old. Anybody out there that's in Kindergarten or first grade? Right, okay. One day, I was your age. <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> but I think about people that help serve and help me grow spiritually, emotionally, and physically. People like Harold Armstrong, Paige Brightman, Lou Weil, Juanita Harrison. When my kids came to this church, they had people like Lori Shepard, Scott and Catherine Hindle helping with, uh, with, the, with the youth choir. And more recently, people like Kate Lane, who stepped in in the interim and helped organize the, the children's ministry while we waited for Andy to show up. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> also, I think about being served by other people in the congregation. About 12 years ago, when my mom died, I remember coming to church the Sunday after she died, and the choir was singing the Messiah. I was touched by their beautiful singing in a way that I could, can't even imagine. 
Also, the prayer shawl ministry gave each of our kids uh, wonderful shawls to remember grandma by. Their, their handiwork and their skilled hands served each of us. And then the Presbyterian women at the funeral brought wonderful food created and baked by their loving hands and served to us. That helps serve us. And then I also think about the deacons every day, day in and day out, caring for each of us in our congregation, making us strong and, and well and cared for and loved. I think about the deacons specifically in ways that help people like my dad, where Dwayne Cable gave my dad rides to doctor's appointments recently. So that's ways that they help serve us and we serve each other. With that, serving each other, we have the strength to find our gifts and use our gifts to go out into the community, whether it is locally, like serving lemonade on the Village Green, or reading to kids at Salem Elementary School, or working on Habitat for Humanity. Those kind of gifts serve our local community. And then we reach beyond that into our state, where we Together, we forgave medical debt for people all over Ohio. We supported a young man named Wes Smith to go to Pittsburgh and do a mission trip for a year. We also have people that go to Montagne de Luz and serve the people there, and the youth group going to Louisiana this year and serving the community there. Service is in our genes as part of our congregation. So as you think about uh, looking at your generosity campaign, think about how you can help connect, serve, and transform. Thanks. Thank you. And now the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. And do share signs of Christ's peace with one another. Thank you. Peace be with you. Yes. Yes. Stop falling out. This one, it falls off all the time. Thank you.
Let us join in our opening sentences. Sharing stories, sharing food, this is our life. Sharing wisdom, sharing hope, this is our truth. Sharing laughter, sharing pain, this is our way. We are servants of the living Lord. Let us worship God. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified by grace as a gift in Jesus Christ. Let us join together in our prayer of confession, spoken and then in a few words, few moments of silence. Let us pray. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have done something different. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have given you food. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have taken you in. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would not have passed you by, but we did. Too often we make excuses for not taking care of each other. We have ignored your commandments to love and care. We do not deserve forgiveness but we ask for it anyway, amazed by the power of your grace. Help us change our ways. Amen.
God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Well, good morning, children. Would you want to come on up here? All right, come on up. Yeah. Awesome, come on up. And you were dressed perfectly, by the way, and you'll see why in a second. <laughs> Look at that. All right. I can pass them out. Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Good. Good. Uh, Nick and I need some help with our children's message today. Would anyone like to help us? Well, we have one right here, Nick. Here we you need go. two more volunteers. Two more? Okay. Let's see here. You can have one. You are so much like a sheep already. I'm going <laughs> to leave that. But you can, you can pretend to be a sheep as well. Sound good? Okay. So today's story comes from the very end of the Gospel of John, where Jesus, Peter, and a few other disciples are having breakfast together shortly before Jesus goes back into heaven. You all are going to be the other disciples having breakfast. Nick is going to be Peter, and I am going to be Jesus. Well, after breakfast, Jesus asked Peter a tough question. Peter, do you love me more than the other disciples? Oh, Jesus, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs then. <sighs> okay, feed the lambs. Feed the lambs. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, right here. Okay, good job. Then Jesus asked Peter again, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Jesus, do you know that I love you? And Jesus replied, then go tend my sheep. Ah, okay. So give him a little pet each year. There you go. Good job. Okay, good job. Good job. Then Jesus asked a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter replied, Oh, Lord, you know everything. Everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said, feed my sheep. Okay, okay. Feed the sheep. Here you go. There you go. There you go. Okay. There you go. So, friends, what do you think Jesus was saying to Peter? Did Jesus want Peter to go become a shepherd? No. <laughs> Did Jesus want Peter to feed and take care of all the sheep in the world? <laughs> what was Jesus saying? When Jesus tells Peter to feed his sheep, he isn't talking about actual sheep, is he? No, he is talking about people. Jesus is often called in the Bible the Good Shepherd because he took care of each and every one of his people, just like a good shepherd takes care of each and every one of his sheep. Just like Jesus called Peter to take care of others, we too are called to take care of one another. Jesus wants us to watch out for another, love each other, and serve others. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? If you do, take care of one another. Just as Jesus loves us and takes care of us, remember that we are called to love Jesus by taking care of one another. Would you pray with us? All right, dear Lord, we want to thank you so much for the deep love that you had for the disciples and the deep love you have for Peter. And Lord, just like you called Peter to love others and take care of one another like a good shepherd takes care of sheep, would we too go out into the world with your eyes to love others and serve others. Amen. All right, good job, everyone. Can we give them a round of applause for their good sheeping? All right.
right, I'll collect that. All right, we are going to head to the chapel. Come on. No, stop. Okay. All right, and confirmands, you can come on down too. Let us pray. God of all wisdom, give us your word, we pray, and send us your spirit so that we may know Christ and serve him with joy. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The Apostle Paul summarizes the good news of the gospel with words that were at the very heart of the Reformation. And then Paul goes on to describe what our life looks like as we respond to that good news. Listen for God's word to us. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, starting at the 31st verse. And this is in a section of Matthew's gospel where Jesus is telling stories or parables about his coming again to judge all peoples. Listen for God's word to us. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The gospel of our Lord Praise to you, O Christ. The story is told of two children who were at the entrance to a church sanctuary, but hesitating to go in. They were whispering to each other and pointing at plaques on the wall. Finally, an usher came to them and said, may I help you? Shyly, one child said, can you tell us what are the names on those plaques? The usher replied, those are the names of people from this church who died in the service. The children looked at each other and looked more terrified than ever. And finally, one whispered, Was that the 8 o'clock or the 10 o'clock service? (laughs) Uh, The word service can mean many things. We call this a worship service for good reason. In fact, this kind of service is at the heart of who we are and what we do 
as followers of Jesus. There's a technical term for everything that goes into a church service, the scriptures, the prayers, the hymns. It's called the liturgy. And liturgy literally means the work of the people. We all participate in important ways, whether it's ushering, making music, welcoming people around you, being the scripture reader, praising God with all of your heart and soul wherever you are. We all serve God and one another in the worship service. If you ever want to usher or be a scripture reader or serve in any way, Talk to one of us pastors. You'll love it, and so will our Lord. We're going to talk about other kinds of service today, too, but I hope we'll remember worship is at the center of it all. Jesus is telling a parable, a teaching story. It's a brilliant teaching tool. Because a parable will entice you to carry it around in your head and in your heart and wrestle with it and try to figure out what is it saying and especially what is it saying to you in particular. Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats has at least three big surprises. One at the beginning one at the end, and one in the middle at the very heart of it all. See what this story of Jesus is saying to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, that's how Jesus begins his story. And I don't know if you've ever noticed but in Matthew's gospel, Jesus never refers to himself as the Messiah or the Son of God. Others do. Satan, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, says to him, if you are the Son of God, make these stones into bread. Later, in Matthew's gospel, demons shout at Jesus, what have you to do with us, son of God? Peter later says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Others call Jesus son of God. Jesus doesn't deny it, but he calls himself something much more humble and much more mysterious. He calls himself the son of man. The son of man means several things at the same time. It means human being. Jesus is trying to prevent someone from emphasizing his divine nature at the expense of his human nature. He is one who will suffer and die for us. He is fully human, the son of man. But son of man also means something else. It's a reference to the book of Daniel from the Old Testament. Daniel has a vision and sees the son of man coming on the clouds of glory to be the divine judge. It's surprising, shocking, really, that here, at this point in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is about to be arrested and crucified, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in glory. It's when, not if. Jesus is pointing beyond the cross to the empty tomb. Jesus will be raised three days later and he will return in glory to judge all people. That's surprise number one 
there at the beginning, the crucified one will be the judge of all people. And that, of course, sets up surprise number two. What is the basis for the Son of Man's judgment? How does Jesus determine who should be at his right and who should be at his left? The shocker is this. In the story Jesus is telling, the judgment is not based on what the people believe, but instead on what the people have done. Specifically, what they have done or not done for the poor. James Forbes, the former pastor of Riverside Church, puts it this way, nobody gets into heaven without a letter of reference from the poor. I know, I know, we heard it in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. For by grace, we are saved through faith, and that is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. That's at the heart of who we are and what we believe as Presbyterians and Reformed people. But Paul's letter in the very next verse goes on to say this, we are what God made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Do you see, in the Bible, it's not one or the other, it's both and. We are saved by grace through faith. And our living faith will bear fruit in our compassion and concern for people in need. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author, wrestled with this, and he sums it up this way. To have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to obey him. Not doing these things like feeding the hungry and welcoming the stranger in order to be saved, but because Jesus has begun to save you already. Not hoping to get to heaven as a reward for your actions, but inevitably wanting to act in a certain way because a first faint gleam of heaven is inside you already. Maybe we can put it this way. Surprise number two should be no surprise at all. How we treat people in need is very important to our Savior and therefore, very important to all of us who love our Savior. Surprise number three is in the middle, and you can't miss it. Both the sheep and the goats are stunned when they hear it, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, Jesus says, you did it to me. The message of a contemporary translation puts it this way. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. This was at the heart of Mother Teresa's teaching and ministry as she cared for people who were sick and dying in Calcutta, India. She went to worship one morning and then talked with her fellow sisters afterwards. And she said to them, during the mass today, you saw how the priest touched the body of Christ, the bread, with such love and tenderness. When you go out today and touch the poor, 
you will be touching the body of Christ. Show the poor that same love and tenderness. Jesus says, that was me. You did it to me. Every year, on the first Monday before Thanksgiving, when I go into Fellowship Hall, I am blown away. At exactly 6 p.m., there's a horde of people and more than 250 boxes on tables, and people are scurrying around putting food, wonderful food, into those Thanksgiving boxes. The room is electric with joy. It's a party and a pleasure to participate. And then the party continues because the next morning, it's like there's a parade. People line up their cars and fill them with those Thanksgiving boxes and then deliver them to schools where they will go to families in need. I was hungry and you fed me, Jesus says. You did it to me. I think of John Hamilton, a church member who died last month at the age of 98. When he was 97, he did the crop walk for hunger with me. He walked a whole mile with me. And then when I visited him at Wesley Glen, he said he couldn't wait for the next Habitat for Humanity build, he was hoping he still had the strength to lift and use a hammer. Serving made John's heart sing. He knew he was serving our Lord as he was serving God's people in need. And it brought him life as he helped to bring new life to others. Again and again, he experienced the joy that comes from that. We can choose. There are big annual mission outreach opportunities that are joy-filled and unforgettable. And there are monthly opportunities like friendship dinners and NEMAP food pantry and daily and weekly opportunities like bread buddies and sack lunches for the homeless. Talk to me if you'd like to learn more about any of these. About every six weeks, we make and serve dinner to about 125 people of all ages at the YWCA Family Center. For me, it's a blast because I get to hang out with dear friends from our church. And as I chop carrots or apples, working alongside my friends, we get to share about what's happening in our lives. I confess, though I'm kind of scared of Kristen, the staff member at the Y who's in charge of the kitchen, because one time I was trying to clean out the dishwasher and as I pulled out the drain, I suddenly realized that there was now an inch of water on the floor of the kitchen and more water coming. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Kristen knows I'm not a natural in the kitchen but she and other church members put up with me. Last month, we noticed there was something different about Kristen. Something was weighing heavy on her heart. And so we talked to her, and we learned that her nephew was missing. And she said the police now considered this not a missing person case, but a homicide case. They were sure that he was another victim of gun violence. We prayed with Kristen. We prayed for Kristen. We prayed for her nephew and her family. 
And we realized something. God brought us there to that kitchen to help families who were homeless, of course. But God also brought us there that night to love and support Kristen. And Danielle, a church member who coordinates this ministry, brought a casserole for Kristen and her family and brought a caring heart. And the family did learn that the nephew's body was found. He had been killed. But the family also found that there was a woman named Danielle and there was a church named Worthington Presbyterian Church that was there for them. That's just one example, friends. By God's grace, we get to financially support and we get to participate in ministries that are much bigger than ourselves. Our church's mission statement says, in Christ's love, we connect, serve, and transform. I've seen it. I, I've experienced it. As we serve, we experience Christ's love. As we serve, we are connected to God and God's people. As we serve, we are transformed and others are transformed. So whether it's in worship or whether it's in some of the other wonderful ways of showing our generosity and serving in Jesus' name, I hope you will hear God's call and I hope you will respond, yes, Lord, at your service. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. No matter the circumstance in our lives and hearts, we can always go to God in prayer. And we have come into this sanctuary this morning with some deep concerns upon our hearts, perhaps with some deep joys as well. So let us now turn our attention to God. Let us pray. Father, we hear of rumors of wars and 
unrest, that we think of the Middle East, we pray your peace into a situation that looks impossible to us to solve, and yet you as the Almighty God know all things, and so we pray for your peace in the Middle East. We pray for those military families, perhaps some in our congregation whose members are in the military, perhaps even deployed, keep them safe. Reassure them and their families that uh, you are the sovereign Lord and hold all things in your hands, even things that we cannot understand. We pray for the Croy family and the passing of Bob. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would wrap your arms of faith, around, of grace around him as you welcome him into your presence and also his family and friends who knew and cared for him deeply. Comfort them. We give you thanks for the Compromands who are even now considering their faith and what it means to join and be a part of this living family of faith. We pray for your wisdom in their lives. We pray for your grace to fill them and their teachers as well. We rejoice in the events of last Tuesday at the Tuesday night together and, and the fellowship and the learning and the joy that was a part of that, that evening. We thank you for all those who planned for it, who prepared the meals, who prepared the studies, who took part in the uh, uh, telling others of this program. And we pray that you would continue to use it to build our faith and our family of faith together. We thank you for the progress and the transformation that we see within this congregation by your grace. And we look forward eagerly to what you are doing now and will be doing. We cannot change the past. We cannot change what was, but we can live in the present and plan for the future and work for your kingdom in those two contexts. And so we pray for your continued wisdom and grace and intervention in our lives and in the life of this good congregation. And we have stepped into the sanctuary with joys, with concerns, even with heartache, and we ask that you would hear us now as we lift these joys and concerns personally and silently and individually to you. Sovereign and gracious God who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, we thank you. We thank you that you hear all our prayers, silence or with words. And we ask for open eyes and ears and hearts to see your answers. And hear us now as we pray together as your people the prayer that uh, your Son and our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has dealt bountifully and richly in his provision in our lives. Let us take this time to present to God our tithes and offerings and thanksgiving to his goodness and grace with which he fills our lives.
Let us pray. Lord God, you have dealt bountifully with us. Nothing that we have do we deserve, but comes into our lives by your grace and mercy, and we give you thanks. And we ask that you would use these tithes and gifts returned to you to further your ministry here, through this place, into the world, and through our lives together for the purposes of your kingdom. We give you thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>